Well, good morning, everyone. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Welcome to our service this morning. Uh, lovely to see some uh, new faces from visitors, some who've been a few times before, as well as some who've been many, many times. Welcome, too, to those who are watching uh, online as we speak and those who will catch up later. We hope you'll be, feel welcome to what we hope is a special celebration service today, celebration of what Jesus has done for us on the cross at the first Easter. So as we come before that living Lord, let's pray together. It's a moment of quiet. Dear Father, this is the best day of the year, the best day of all time. For on Easter day, we find that Jesus, who was dead, is alive again. And we see his promise that those who put their trust in him will not be swept away by death, but shall have eternal life. On this day of light and gladness, help us to put darkness out of our lives. Make us willing and able to change our ways of thinking and speaking and doing into Easter ways so that how we behave may bear out what we believe and so that Christ's new creation may become in us not just a hope but a fact through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well let's continue to praise God for what he's done in our first song. Jesus Christ is risen today. Hallelujah. to read our first reading, which is that story of what happened the first Easter from Mark's Gospel. <coughs> reading from Mark 16, 1 to 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome 
bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Thank you, Brian. And we're going to just uh, watch a short film to tell us what happened after that, the Easter Sunday film. On the Sunday, the story takes a dramatic twist. The stone has been rolled away. The grave is empty. Just imagine being those first women at the tomb. The angels say, why do you look for the living? are a mixture of confusion and excitement. They question whether the woman has got it right. But when they get to the tomb, they are baffled. What's going on? Has Jesus just disappeared? Or will he come back? Then suddenly, the whole thing begins to make sense. They're in a locked room, locked in with fear, there is Jesus. The risen Jesus appears amongst them. They're shocked. The man they saw crucified, that they know is dead, is in the room. Peace be with you. He proves it's him and that he is no ghost. He shows them his hands and his feet. Luke writes, they didn't initially believe because of an overwhelming sense of joy and amazement. Yet here they are, in the same house, the same people, but everything is different. And Jesus commissions them to share his message of of repentance, of lives turned round, back to our creative purpose, back to our true identity. Jesus is alive. In this week, we glimpse the wonder of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, and the love Jesus. And a new week begins with Jesus defeating death. He proves he is who he claimed to be. He is the one that the Jews have been waiting for, but he was so much more. The people wanted a Messiah to free them from Rome. Jesus' kingdom wasn't what they'd expected. It was bigger, wider, fuller, better. Jesus' humiliating death and his victorious resurrection offer everyone freedom from the grip of sin, freedom from the power of evil, and ultimately freedom from the sting of death. His victory is our victory if we just accept it. He shows us victory. He invites us to celebrate. He invites us to celebrate, so let's do that with our next song, which is, Lo, in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior.
moments in praise and prayer, if two or three people can lead us in worshipping the God who arose. Let's pray. Amen. Give thanks to you, Lord, that you are the true standard. Lord, we can show you your grace that we can look back on. Lord, we can just say thank you. We look to you, thanks, Lord, for how it seems to be your obedience to you. Thank you, Lord, for being so patient to bear with us. Amen. Father God, we worship you today with joy in our hearts and thanksgiving in our lips. When the powers of evil had done their worst, crucifying your son and burying him in death, you raised him to life again, an act of power giving hope to the world. Jesus Christ, we rejoice that death could not keep you in its grip, that you were raised to life, alive forevermore. You greeted your friends, and now you stand amongst us in your risen power. Holy Spirit, you are always giving life to the people of God, giving birth to children of God. Remodel us in the image of Jesus. Fill us with his love and enable us with his risen power. 
that we might be faithful to his way, used by you in the rede redeeming of your world. Amen. 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 Now, normally we would have notices at this point. I'm not sure that there are any notices particularly, but Miriam, are there? Um, there's only one really, is on Thursday, it's the Thursday evening um, fellowship group, but instead of half past seven, it'll be at eight o'clock, it'll be on Zoom, so there's a, a link, the normal link that will work, even though it's half an hour later, if you know what I mean. And the other thing, I'm really sorry to do this without notice to either of our two <laughs> leaders, um, but we've got a little bit of church business to do, and there are actually enough of us church members here today. If you could just stay in maybe that corner where Betty and Trevor are, um, it will take five minutes literally after the service. Is that all right if we do that? We've got three decisions to make, and that's it. So it, it will be really, really quick, I honestly promise you. Um, <laughs> And I'm sorry to do that on Easter Day, but we've been trying to make this decision for a while. Is that sorry to do? <laughs> okay, and the last thing, happier things. Anybody got a birthday? <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, we've got. <laughs> we can sing happy birthday. To you. <laughs> so it's just Derek. I am honestly not going to start off the singing because it <laughs> I'll ask someone else to do that. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Derek, happy birthday to you. Bless you Derek for another year of great um, support and service here. Thank you Miriam. And, um, We'll just take our, our weekly offering now, our contributions for the life of the church and the community. Lord Jesus, you gave your everything for us. Lord, we offer you this uh, small offering of your blessings to us, asking you to use it for your service in this church and in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, I'm going to invite Maggie forward, if she would, to give us our second reading, which is um, from Mark's Gospel, that, uh, and then Jonathan will be preaching after that. Thank you. Yeah, this is from Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, what do people, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his Father's glory with the holy angels. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this tremendous day that we're celebrating today. Thank you, Lord, that you have rescued us, that you did not stay in the grave, but you rose from the dead again on the third day. Lord, speak to us through your word afresh. Holy Spirit, fall on us this morning. Renew us, restore us, heal us, work within our hearts and our minds, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, um, again, a welcome for anybody online as well that's watching. Uh, it's lovely to see so many people here today. Um, I've been really suffering this week, so uh, I think there's a story, isn't there, in the Bible about Moses holding up the staff, and then somebody had to come and support him. If I look like I'm failing, then Rod, Maggie, you can come and hold me up, uh, and, uh, and that'll be wonderful. So um, I'm officially better, but uh, still suffering from the effects uh, of COVID, unfortunately. So um, uh, it's a wonderful illness if you haven't had it. Um, I, I don't want to share it with you. Um, thankfully, I don't have to anymore because I'm not apparently contagious. Um, so, uh, but yes, we do pray for everybody that's suffering this morning. There have been four and a half million people in the UK apparently got it two weeks ago. I don't know what the figures were last week, um, but it is, it is pretty rife. Um, so if you are suffering with that or anything else, we do pray for you and please do ask for prayer. Um, today we're looking at a wonderful passage. We're actually up to this sort of passage in Mark, which is Mark chapter eight. And I've labeled this, who is this Jesus? He tries to answer this question that has kind of been dodging for the whole of his ministry up to now. And the story of the whole Bible centers on this day. I've got a, a picture of a puzzle uh, behind me here. Um, does anybody like puzzles? Yeah, great. Um, what is it like when you do a puzzle and then you realize that after all that effort, you've still got a missing piece. It's painful. It is painful. It's frustrating. Yeah, isn't it? It's like the whole thing has been completed, yet there's still a hole there right in the center. And you've got no idea where that piece has gone. Now, as you can probably imagine, in our household, there's an awful lot of activity a lot of the time. And uh, in my sort of office upstairs, we have lots of puzzles but the issue is, the kids kind of like, particularly the younger ones, mixing them all up together. And it makes things really rather tricky for completing puzzles, especially when you have the missing pieces. So you go to all the effort of putting the puzzles together, but then there's still a hole there. And you're thinking, oh no, where has that piece gone? And this is a little bit like what it was for the Jews. They were looking for their Messiah. But the Messiah still hadn't come. And now the disciples finally think that Jesus is that person. 
He has fulfilled God's plan. He's the person to make the entire puzzle work. You know, the prelude to our passage today is actually about a blind man. We're going to go back and look at this when we come back to Mark next year. And um, there's a two-stage healing. Jonathan, can we have the next slide, please? And it's really a really interesting passage because Jesus heals the man. But the first time, Jesus asks him what he can see. And he says, I can see people walking around like trees. Isn't that weird? Couldn't Jesus like heal him just like that? So Jesus lays his hands on him again. And this time, in verse 25 of chapter 8, if you're looking at it, his sight is restored completely. And he saw everything clearly. Next slide, Jonathan. Do you know when Jesus spoke in parables? Now, I'd already always had the presumption that Jesus spoke in parables because it was good stories. Because as human beings, we like stories, don't we? Yeah, we're all storytellers. We like watching TV, soap operas, The Archers, if you've been listening to that for the last 75 years or however long it's been on, or whatever. We like stories, don't we? We like fairy tales when we're children. Some of them are quite scary. But we like a good story, whether it's to excite us, if it's adventure, if it's something to scare us, we like a good story. And the Bible is pretty amazing because it has loads of stories in. And I'd always presume that Jesus taught in parables because we like stories. Well, that's kind of partly true. But when he was asked why he spoke in parables, he said this. This is chapter 4 of Mark in verse 12. He said, so they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Ever hearing, but never understanding. You know, there's a two-stage process that we go through when we start to find out about God. I don't know whether you ever did this yourself. And sometimes, even as Christians, we still go through this process. God is speaking to us, but we don't know what he's saying to us. We're reading something in the Bible, but we don't quite understand what it means. Are you saying this thing, Lord, or are you saying this thing? What is it all about? And it's not until the Holy Spirit comes and illuminates what God is trying to say to us that it's like our eyes are opened and instead of seeing the wood for the trees, we actually see what God is saying. We need the Holy Spirit, God inside us, to show us the truth of what is going on. You know, we read as... Um, in chapter 6 and verse 52, that even though that Jesus did all these incredible miracles in front of the disciples, the disciples still did not understand. Despite all these things, Jesus stilling the wind and the waves, Jesus healing people, Jesus bringing people back from the dead, Jesus walking on water, yet still the disciples did not understand. They just saw the trees. They had no idea who Jesus was. So this passage is about the missing piece. The missing puzzle piece. So who do you think Jesus is this morning? I'm asking you here, I'm asking you online. Who do you think Jesus is? You know, Mark opens his account of Jesus' life by giving us a spoiler in verse 1. And then his entire account is then going on to explain who is this person. It's the most important question that we can possibly ask. Who is this man? Because the answer to this question will change your life. And it will change your eternal destination. It can change whether you worry at night about all the things around you or whether you feel an assurance and a peace that God has got your life in his hands. Who is this man? Jesus asked that very question 
at the beginning of our passage in verse 27. Who do people say I am? The disciples give him three answers in verse 28, which reflects actually the answers, interestingly, that Herod gets when he's thinking about who Jesus was in chapter 6. John the Baptist, Elijah, or one of the prophets. You know, when we see things, we try and rationalize them, don't we? Even as Christians, we kind of stop believing in miracles. Do we? I really hope we don't. We believe in a God that created the heavens and the earth, and we should believe in a God that can do miracles even today. But I don't know about you, even I rationalize things. I say even I. I'm a very rational person. I try and rationalize everything. I try and rationalize something and say, well, this doesn't make sense, so it must be this. But what if it means something completely different? What if God is trying to say something or do something in our lives? You know, each title that Jesus has given is kind of ridiculous in a way, if you think about it. John the Baptist. How can Jesus be John the Baptist? We know that Jesus was baptized by John. John was still alive while Jesus was doing miracles. Yet Herod and the disciples are entertaining the idea that Jesus might be John the Baptist. It's madness, isn't it? Elijah. Well, that's slightly, I suppose, a little bit more likely. The Jewish people, thinking about the missing piece, were waiting for Elijah to come back to bring in the end of days. They were waiting for this moment to happen. Perhaps Jesus was Elijah. Well, one of the prophets, well, Jesus did prophesy. And in fact, there's a major religion today that still sees Jesus as a prophet. One of the most important prophets in their religion. So Jesus was a prophet. But was he just a prophet? After 400 years silence, who was this man? Verse 29, Jesus turns to the disciples and he says to them, but what about you? Who do you say I am? If nothing else this morning, I would like you to answer that question before God this morning. Who do you think Jesus is? You might have been here all of your life. You might have been to several Alpha courses or Christianity Explored courses. You may have been through the Sunday school. Or you might have been to the Easter activities that Hannah was running uh, with some wonderful help this week. She wants to thank you all very much for that. Did that answer your question? Or is that question still hanging in the air? C.S. Lewis once said this, you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up. You can spit at him. You can even kill him. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You might think that Jesus' words are wise that you read in the scripture, but he wasn't here to be a wise man. He wasn't here to be a prophet. He wasn't here to be a healer or a person that could control the wind and the waves. He was here because this central chapter in Mark is telling you one thing. Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You know, it's the first time that the word Messiah, ho Christos in the Greek, and ha Messiah in the Hebrew is mentioned in Mark. What does it mean? You know, we had a glimpse of it, actually, in the video that we just, uh, that we just saw. Great video, Rod, fantastic. Um, 
And it was talking really about the fact that the Jewish people were expecting this Messiah, but then he came and he was far more. I would actually argue something else. He was completely different. The Jewish people were expecting a warrior king. And instead of a warrior king, what do they get? They were expecting a king to be in the line of David. Well, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He was in the line of David. But there's a difference here. They were expecting this new king to lead them in victory against the Romans, just like all of the older kings had led them in victory against the nations around them. They were expecting this new king to build a kingdom that would last forever. Now, Jesus would But it was a different kind of kingdom. They were expecting this king to be wielding a sword. And instead, Jesus has something very different to tell them. You know, this word Messiah is the most dangerous title any Jew could have had. The Romans were aware about it. The Jewish council were certainly looking out for it. And so Jesus said, first of all, in verse 30, don't tell anybody about it. It's dynamite. In fact, Jesus only revealed himself that he was the Messiah on the day he was tried by the Sanhedrin in chapter 14. When he said, you are who who you say I am. So what was God's plan instead if it wasn't to be a warrior king? We read in verse 31 of chapter 8, Jesus began to teach them. You know, sometimes it's a process for us as well, isn't it? It's a process that goes on. Jonathan, we're a couple of slides ahead now. (laughs) Absolutely, we're there. That's fantastic. And he began to teach them. First of all, he was teaching them that his purpose on earth was to die. Specifically, to suffer many things, be rejected, and then be murdered. But the story did not finish there. We are here this morning because he then prophesied to his disciples that he would rise again on the third day. Before his death and during that whole period of time, Jesus was to be rejected. You know, notice there are three groups of people which reject him here. The elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. It represents the entire Jewish nation. It's a total rejection of Jesus. But Peter doesn't get it. His heart is still hard. His ears are still muffled. Peter's still seeing trees. So he takes him to one side. Lord, this can't be true. No, you're the Messiah. What I mean by that, Lord, is you're going you're to lead us in an insurrection against the Romans. We're going to be victorious. And you're going to be our leader, Lord. I'm filling in the gaps. Jesus said something pretty harsh. Get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. This was one of his most loved disciples. This is the disciple that he renamed the rock because he was going to build his church on him. Yet he says, get thee behind me, Satan. When it's not a plan of God... There's only one other place the plan can come from. We've got to make sure we're in God's plan. And this was yet another temptation to Jesus. What would have been easier for Jesus? To die on the cross for us? To suffer death for three days? Or to lead an insurrection against the Romans? He could have called down heaven's armies... And he could have brought the end to all pain and suffering. That wasn't the way. It wasn't the way because there were still billions of people that needed to come to faith in Jesus so we could be saved eternally. 
It wasn't the way because God's way was the cross, was suffering for Jesus on our behalf. Jesus' way was to tear the the temple curtain from top to bottom to open up the way to God for us through his own blood. He became the Passover lamb for us to shed his blood to take away your sin and my sin. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yet that wasn't the easy way. And he knew it. You know, before COVID, who would have thought that streaming a church service was the thing? Who would have thought doing elevensies that we do a couple of times a week still would be a thing? Prayer meetings on Zoom or home groups on Zoom. Who would have thought that God would blow the church doors open wide so the world can access us? So the world can see what's actually going on inside a church? I can't tell you some of the most amazing responses we've had over the last two years to different things from people that I would never have thought in a million years would have been interested in Jesus. There is desperation out there, and there are people desperate to hear that Jesus loves them, that he can heal them, that he can deal with the issues of addiction and sin in their lives, that he can put them back together, that he can start to show them the true path. And God has shown us that. But who would have thought it? God had a different plan through this terrible disease to open up the church doors. You know, what's the point of Easter Sunday unless it's making a difference to our lives? You know, Rod in his opening prayer was talking about us enacting on what we believe. You can come here and we've got some great songs coming up. We've sung some wonderful old hymns. And we can sing the hymns and we can go, ah, happy Easter, wow, fantastic, he is arisen, hallelujah. And then we can go back home and be very different people, can't we? God knows our hearts. He knows our minds. God wants us to live his way because it's a way of freedom. It's emancipating us, setting us free from the chains of sin and death. There's no point to Jesus coming unless that was the way. And that's the way that leads to eternal life. That's the way to lead the fact that Jesus one day will clothe you in robes of righteousness before his Father if you believe in him. It's not from what you have done, but it's what Jesus has done. So what is he asking you to do at the end of this passage? It's a salutary passage, actually. If you want to follow Jesus, you've got to do something. He says in verse 34, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. I think we know what cross means. The cross that Jesus carried was the crossbar on the way to Golgotha. It was the very heavy bar which became the centerpiece that he was crucified on. What does that mean? Deny oneself to follow him. Can we have the next slide, Johnny, please? Who wants to be famous here? Who wants to be successful in what they do at work? Who wants to earn lots of money? Come on, be honest. Cool, there's quite a few young people who have stuck their hands up, and Miriam. Okay. Who wants to be known for what they've done? Even just within their industry, or within their office, or within their school, or university, or maybe nationally, or maybe even internationally. Caleb sticking his hand up to every one of these questions. I like the honesty, Caleb. Thank you. Josiah as well. Brilliant. 
My challenge to you today is lay all that before the Lord. He may not want that path for you. God knows what's right for you. He has got a path laid out before you. And the first thing is to deny yourself. What that means is lay it in front of the Lord and say, Lord, if these plans are not your plans, then you lead me on the path that you want me to go on. It could be a path of suffering like Jesus went on. It could be a path which does lead to something incredible for you. But only if it's in praise of God. Only if people can know about the name of Jesus by the way you live your life. You know, God is interested in one thing in your life, and that's a relationship with you. He wants you to get your relationship right with him this morning. Taking up your cross is crucifying all of your desires, all of your hopes, all of your fears, all of your pain, all of your suffering, and everything you've been through, and giving it to God. Saying, God, take me as I am. Wash me clean. Forgive me for what I've done. And forgive those who have done things to me. Heal me. Make me whole. Raise me to new life again. Give me that life that you have promised through being risen again on the third day. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for somebody to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? I'm going to guarantee one thing to you today. That if you give up your life, God has got something better for you. He's got something so precious, so wonderful, so incredible for you if you give your life to him this morning. And if you give your life to him afresh, if you already know him, he has got something incredible for you. The first thing is his peace, his joy, the hope that you have a future in Christ, the hope that you're forgiven, that you know that you're forgiven because the Holy Spirit will come on you and assure you that your sins are dealt with forever. The Lord loves you. He stretches out his arms on that Good Friday to show you how much he loves you. It's the same arms that are stretched out to the long lost son as the son runs towards his father and the father towards the son. God wants to welcome you home this morning. And one day he wants to say, well done, my good and faithful servant as he welcomes you into heaven with all of his angels. Amen. Amen. As we're singing these uh, songs coming up, I know we're doing communion now. As we're celebrating communion and singing the songs, I really want you to think about just giving your life afresh to the Lord, laying down those things before him which you're holding on to. Let him move into you afresh this morning. If anybody would like to come and sing as well, they're very welcome. Thank you, Jonathan. And apologies to the older, older members for you forgetting to put the light on at the front there. I think you're gathering that today is all about the cross, isn't it? So in response to uh, what Jonathan's has shared with us, let's sing our next song, which is... Um, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. Once again, I thank you for the cross.
time of prayer, but instead of the usual um, prayers that we're praying together, I thought uh, we'd do something slightly different uh, today. And it's a prayer of petition, but it's a prayer particularly for Ukraine. And we'll be praying over a video which we're going to show, which is the song The Blessing, which you may know yourselves in the English version. This is the Ukrainian version. Um, please, if you, uh, if you know the English version you want to sing over it, that's absolutely fine. But uh, there'll come up um, uh, requests for prayer also for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and for what's going on there. Uh, so be prayerful as we uh, look at this video. Okay. Uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus, when we are despairing, when the world is full of grief, when we see no way ahead and hope has gone away, roll back the stone. Although we fear change, although we are not ready, although we'd rather weep and run away, roll away the stone. Because we're coming with the women, because we hope where hope is vain, because you call us from the grave and show the way, roll back the stone. Amen. Well, as Jonathan said, we'll be coming to a time of communion in a moment. It's lovely that the children shared our service, the full service today, and thank you for their great behavior um, so far. That's brilliant. As we do so, let's just, just pray uh, once more. It is, it is fitting that the heavens should rejoice and that the earth should be glad and that the whole world, both visible and invisible, should keep the feast. For Christ is risen, the everlasting joy now all things are filled with light, heaven and earth, and all places under the earth. All creation celebrates the resurrection of Christ. It is the day of resurrection. Let us be glorious in splendor for the celebration. And let us embrace one another. Let us speak also, brothers and sisters, to those that hate us, 
and in the resurrection, let us forgive all things. So let us cry, Christ has risen from the dead, by death trampling on death, and has bestowed life to those who were dead. Now if my friends could come to help me who are serving. The Apostle Paul tells us of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. and said, this is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. We welcome all those who are uh, believers in Christ to share with, in the bread and wine with us. If you feel not ready to do so this morning, uh, we're offering you uh, grape or berries uh, as a seed of faith. Uh, please share with us. Risen Christ, you walked with friends and explained the scriptures. Warm our hearts with your living word. Lord Jesus Christ, be known to us in the breaking of bread. Take this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. Risen Christ, you were a guest in the home of disciples. In this fellowship, be our guest. And transform our life together with you, living presence. Lord Jesus Christ, be known to us in the sharing of the cup. Drink this and remember that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. We'll hold the cup and drink together as a sign of our unity in Christ. the blood of Christ shed for you. Your death, O Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection, we confess. Your final coming, we await. Glory be to you, O Christ. Amen. 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 Now I'm going to hand over to Jonathan to lead us in a time of worship as we close. So in the first song, it's King of Kings, um, just really recognizing the fact that um, Jesus has brought us from darkness uh, into light if we b believe in him.
Death Was Arrested, which was sung a few times. Um, we couldn't resist really uh, singing that together. This is all about death being defeated uh, on this day 2,000 years ago.
just thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you that you accept us as we are. But Lord, you want us to lay down everything before you this morning. We lay down our ambitions, our desires, our wants, and our needs. We lay down our fears, our hopes, our terrors, our hurts, our disappointments. We lay down our health and our hopes for the future. We give you our family and our friends. We lay down the situation in this world, in Ukraine and in so many other areas. Lord, we know that you can work both within the world around us and in our own lives. Lord, we pray that you would take us as we are, that you would remake us, that you would change us, you would wash us clean with your blood. You would renew us this morning, Lord. We pray that we would never deny you or the power of your spirit in our lives. We pray that you would give us words to say, stories to tell about the work that you've done in our lives to people around us. We pray that you would embolden us and open our mouths and our hearts, open our homes and give us the love that we need to love people around us. So Lord, when we meet you in heaven with your angels, we would know we've never denied you but you will accept us with open arms, saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's finish with that boldly I approach. We can approach because of what Jesus has done for us, and this is just such a wonderful song to sing uh, on, uh, on Easter Day.
invite you to stay on afterwards for a cup of tea or coffee. Uh, thanks to Sue for that. And um, please uh, let, let us talk to you if you have time. And as we go, a final blessing. Almighty God, through the raising of your son from the grave, you broke the power of death and condemned death itself to die. As we celebrate this great triumph, may we also make it a model for our living. Help us to identify in our lives all that should rightly die, redundant relationships, tired habits, fruitless longings. Resurrect in our lives faith, hope, and love as surely as you raised Jesus Christ from the grave. Amen. Shall we share the grace together as we close? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.